Hi everyone. Another interview today, talking all about food with uh, Linda, which would be super, because um, certainly um, it's cornerstone, I think, when it comes to uh, brain health and our overhaul and immu overhaul, overall immune health. Um, it's uh, it's key. Hi everyone. Um, just waiting for um, Linda to join, and we'll get cracking in a few minutes. Uh, what a fab day it is today! Oh my God, it's like uh, stunning out. Uh, so hopefully everyone gets to enjoy a bit of sunshine when we have the lovely weather. I hope you're all enjoying the interviews so far this week. I'm kind of behind on uploading them. There's quite a few to upload, so um, I'll be doing that hopefully later on today um, and tomorrow so you can catch up with all of them. I had a fantastic chat yesterday with um, with Dr. Um, Moscone, which was just fabulous. So yeah, loads of great, great chats and sleep and uh, diabetes this morning with um, Siobhan D. There's uh, Linda now, just a sec. Hi, Linda. How are you? How are you, Catherine? How are things? I'm good. I'm good. I was just saying what a what a cracking, lovely day it is today. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I have to get out for some rays after this. Yeah, vitamin D required big time after the, the weather the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And by all accounts, it's going to be thunderstorms later on, so I, enjoy it while we can now. I heard that. Yeah, I heard that. So anyway, yeah, I'm going to enjoy it. serious blue skies here in Dublin. So um, yeah, it's glorious here glorious here okay so you've had a busy uh, week yes it's been i was saying it's been fantastic oh just the yeah, all, amazing, so. all of them it's just been great and i i really hope you know the whole idea of it is trying to reach as many people as possible and, you know yeah. just get the knowledge from so many experts and so yeah yeah it's been brilliant Um so today uh linda uh we're going to chat all about food um, yes, and I think we're both uh, really passionate uh, about food. And um, on, um, I did a, an interview this morning with Siobhan D talking about diabetes, and you know we were both kind of saying, you know, food is the cornerstone. It's not just for brain health; it's for everything, your immune system, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just everything. It really is. And I think if we go back to when we were younger you know so much has changed like we're both from Kilkenny I can remember I can remember running up to to um, Madeline Street to get fresh tomatoes from um, um, a man up there who used to grow tomatoes and the, the taste of them it was just it was so different to what, you know yeah. can often taste nowadays so um, yes so food so I, I guess when we talk about food there's so much to cover so what we really want to just talk about, you know, what do you see as being the real heavy hitters? What are the, the yeah. real things for your brain health, your overall yeah. that we need to be including in our diets? Yeah, well, you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, you know, food has changed a lot, but I think what people often, I mean, I'm a nutritionist and when people come into me, they'll often think that I'm going to take out this and take out that but often what we're doing is focusing on what's currently missing from their diet and adding them back in and the nutrients for brain health are are, are heavy hitters you're absolutely correct the first one i suppose to, to look at are fats so your brain is made of about 60 percent fat possibly more and women in particular are terrified of fat we are we are fat phobic as a society i think anymore mm. now i know not all fats are created equal but i think it's important for people to realize that your hormones are made of fat every cell in your body and 60 percent of your brain so we have a high demand for fat you know it's, it's very important macronutrients that people need it's it is essential for life um one of the big uh, groups of fats that are really important are omega threes, and omega three. There is there's omega three, six, and nine, but they're essential fatty acids. And the reason they're called essential is because our body can't make them. We have to get them in in our diet, mm -hmm. and it is you know they're the ones that are really important for promoting brain health and supporting having the right uh, fats in your brain. 
Yeah, and um, so Linda, isn't the when you look at um, our diets today, like um, I think we probably just through a normal diet, you may get a lot of six and nine, but it's the omega three is the more yeah. difficult one to get without kind of targeting kind of specific food, yeah. right? It is, it is absolutely, and I suppose there is the the easiest way to get omega three is through oily fish. Um, now, people, some people are going to balk at the idea idea of oily fish, and I suppose when I'm talking to people, I always try and go through the different types of fish to see. Yeah. You know, some people will like smoked salmon occasionally, or they'll like maybe a a, a trout pate, or they'll like um, a tinned salmon, whereas they wouldn't like fresh salmon or. A lot of people are averse to cooking salmon or you know, cooking fish because they don't like the smell of it in their house, but they might eat it when they go out. Um, but omega-3s, are they're essential and they're very anti-inflammatory type of foods. So you're correct. If we have a lot of omega-6s in our diet, which naturally come from like sunflower oil, and it comes from a lot of like grains and that kind of thing too, they can, if there's too many of them and not enough omega-6s, can be pro-inflammatory. And the last thing we want when it comes to brain health is anything that's going to exacerbate inflammation. Omega-3s are absolutely anti-inflammatory. And if you're not a fish eater, you're getting, I mean, they are the best source and there's two types of EPA and DHA in those. And DHA is the one that's particularly important for brain health. But if you're not a fish eater, you can take um, something like a flax oil or a chia seed or flax seeds even, and they will contain a type of omega-3. Now, they're not as readily available to the body in that the body needs to do a conversion of them. So it is a bit more difficult, but there's definitely a source there. Yeah, yeah. So you're getting your omega-3s. And if you're not a fish eater, it may be worth considering. If you have any symptoms of an omega-3 deficiency or like if you have dry skin, if you are getting a foggy brain, it is worth looking to see, would it be worth considering putting in a supplement, even for a short period of time to see if you feel the benefits of it. Yeah, I had you know. a message from a, a follower just this morning, actually, saying that um, I, I must have done some stories on it a while ago. And she said she'd started, uh, doesn't like fish, she started Omega-3 recently. Mm -hmm. And she said within, within six weeks, she's seen a huge difference to her yeah. brain fog. But, you know, yeah. I think it, it's, it's definitely... Um, certainly the number one when it comes to to the brain um, and like you say fish there's um an acronym that dr moscone uses which is smash um, and yeah. comes to the fish so it's like a salmon mackerel anchovies sardines and herring are the, yeah. the top the oily fish yeah yeah plugging a kilkenny business you can get some omega-3s from trout as well we have a oh. goat's bridge trout in kilkenny oh, yeah. If you like it, they do a gorgeous pate, which is really, you know, they, they obviously a lot of trout, but very handy if you if you're not a fish eating house to even have it as a snack. It's it's delicious, and you know it, they're nice sources of fish. Or of of if you like the taste, a lot of people forget. People would often say to me they would have had sardines a lot as a child, and they just kind of forget them anymore. Do you know, yeah. so if, if you do like them, it's just worth considering adding them in there. It's you know it's really important for your health but it's important for your hormone health as well as as women like if somebody's got quite bad pms or you know if they've got their hidden menopausal symptoms one of the first things if somebody comes to me with menopause that i'd be looking at is if their omega-3 levels are low will that help to reduce some of their what feels like all menopausal symptoms maybe an omega-3 deficiency that we need to correct too you know so it's, it's Big time. It, it's a nice one to put in and see if you can get benefits. And you're right, quite quickly you'll see the, the, the effects. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. That's really important. Um, what else? Nuts and seeds, really important as well as a source of omega-3s and omega-6s of all the fats, but they're also a great source of protein. So the one thing, I suppose, with overall health, with anything, including brain health, is to try and get as much variety into the diet as possible, to get a variety of nutrients from different food sources. So some people will have a good diet, but it will be quite limited to the same foods every day. And that's fine for a period of time, but you're you're missing out on other stuff. It's not that foods are good or bad, but what are you missing by not eating the variety? So if people, especially if they don't like um, the oily fish, if they include portions of, of mixed nuts and seeds on a daily basis, 
you're going to get fiber, you're going to get your omegas from them and a variety in there. Things like extra virgin olive oil as well, really good source of omega-9. And if you look at the Mediterranean diet and even the mind diet that people would often reference for, for brain health, it's very heavily influenced with extra virgin olive oil as even more so than omega-3 in some studies, they'd be saying yeah. that that would be where you get the benefit. So really good to include. And like this time of the year when the weather is good, a very simple olive oil dressing with a vinegar or lemon juice or something can get it in and add lovely flavor to your food. The other thing, I suppose, with um, just, adding just, things like... Sorry, just go for it. The, um, the olive oil. I, I've done... Um, I, I did a lot of research on, on um, extra virgin last year and... I had I shared some stories during the week, but I, I'm going to do a live in another week or two. Just the one thing I would say is that just be careful with the extra virgin olive oil in terms of the quality of what you're buying. Look at the leaf yeah. and also because you don't want it blended and you don't want it bottled in Italy, but um, olives from Greece, Spain, Portugal and different countries and plus storing it is really, really important. Um, yeah, keep it in the dark. Yeah, because uh, what a lot of people do is they leave it on the countertop and I didn't kind of realise how rancid it will go so quickly mm -hmm. if you don't yeah. sit in a kind of dark, uh, cool place. Yeah. Because the benefits of extra virgin olive oil are huge. Absolutely. Yeah. But you have to. They are. Sure. Yeah, you do have to mind. And I mean, you know, good extra virgin olive oil costs money so yeah. you would want to yeah. mind it a little bit yeah. do you know but it's that even the taste and everything it does make a difference and i suppose the other thing with fat and people tend to forget this is fat adds flavor and creates satiety so if you're eating food that has no fat in it you're not going to have the same level of satisfaction or fullness afterwards and people kind of they're, then they're finished their their meal and they're like oh i fancy something else now because they just don't have that level of satisfaction after having their meal. And that's what fat gives you. Yeah. So I know people are afraid of it, but if you can even look at adding in those few things, it doesn't need to be a huge quantity. Just start looking at where can you add small quantities of good quality fats into your diet. Your brain will benefit. Absolutely. Now, there's the, the butt side of it. The fats that we don't particularly want in are the, the processed fats or the, the trans fats. And uh, basically, they're in... It's it's going to be the same across the board. They're in your your processed foods, your baked goods, your biscuits, anything with a long shelf life that has fat. The fat has been modified to make sure that it remains stable because, as you said, fat can get rancid quite quickly. So they need to stabilize it. But in the process of stabilizing the fat, they can make it um, so that your body really doesn't recognize it and doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. So there are good fats and not so good fats, and we'd like to focus on getting in the good fats. That's what where the yeah. aim of the game is. Yeah. Um, so that's fat is the first one. Yeah. The second thing, and I'm, I, I actually didn't even get to listen to your talk this morning when you were talking about diabetes, but the second thing that's really important is blood sugar control. Yeah. And in relation to diabetes, so we have two hormones that balance every time you eat sugar in any form. We have two hormones that manage your sugar, your sugar. The first one is insulin and the second one is cortisol. Now, cortisol is your stress hormone. And I know you may have mentioned it once or a hundred times oh. in the last couple of days. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's and I suppose people kind of are wondering why are, as a nutritionist do you care about cortisol? But if your cortisol levels are high, it can affect your digestive system. It affects what you're eating. It, it's affecting your sleep. And you're, if you're not sleeping well, your sleep is affecting what you're eating. But it, it also, when your cortisol levels are high, it puts a higher demand for nutrients on your body. So you may be eating the perfect diet and getting 100% of what you need every day. But because your stress levels are so high, you may actually need 150% versus somebody else who isn't as stressed. So like... You know, having a stressful day or a stressful week is one thing, but if it's chronic long term stress, yeah. you may just your, your nutrient stores will get depleted really quickly and your overall health will suffer. And if your brain is your weak link in your body, that will that's where it will present itself first for you, you know. Yeah. And so it's important. Yeah, I think that's like every single every single interview this week, all of them, cortisol and stress. And the impact on the brain has come up in some shape or form. Yeah. 
So I think, yeah. And I suppose the reality is, Catherine, you know, we live in a very busy world anymore and it's naive for us to think that we can just make all the stress go away. So the one thing I would always say to people that I'm talking to is we have to try and figure out how we can manage the stress a little bit better. Yeah. Um, now, from my perspective, the first place I start with managing my own stress is how I'm eating, yeah. because how you're eating will have a, a, an impact on your cortisol. So I mentioned the insulin and cortisol mm -hmm. you will have gone through this morning. If you're... Um, if your insulin levels are increasing all the time, that's going to cause problems for your brain health um, because it's going to put you at a higher risk of type 2 diabetes. But the cortisol on the other side is doing the same thing. So what should we be eating? Routinely, what I recommend is eating three square meals a day. Now, there's all different recommendations around should you be eating a little and often, should you be doing time-restricted feeding where you eat in a shorter window of time, and it really does depend on where you're starting now. So if you are somebody who's very sensitive to sugar, if you have a lot of carbohydrates in your diet, and I'm going to go through the actual foods in one second, but if you're somebody who's eating a lot of carbohydrates at the moment and you try and restrict your time frame for eating, you will find it very difficult and you'll find your mood is very impacted by it. Yeah. You will also find that you may be waking up in the middle of the night for no apparent reason, and it may be caused by your blood sugar crashing in the middle of the night. Okay. So that afternoon slump that people will recognize when they kind of get to that mid-afternoon and they, their body is telling them they'd like a, you know, a cup of coffee and a bar of chocolate, rarely looking for carrot sticks at that hour of the day. <laughs> but if you get that slump in the middle of the night, your body thinks when you're producing cortisol that you're in a fight or flight scenario yeah. and it will wake you up. So, you know, that's another area where cortisol can have an impact on, on your body and, and what happens the next day. So eating three square meals a day would basically mean that we want to have proteins, some good carbohydrates. And what I mean by good carbohydrates is more brown than white. Yeah. Um, and it sounds very simple, but I, I use this analogy all of the time. If you're thinking of rice for example and you have 50 grams of white rice as your carb on your chicken curry dinner 50 grams of white rice would provide you with with x number of calories and calories are just a measure of energy that you get there's nothing else there there is no fiber there are no vitamins there are no minerals there is just energy if you switch your 50 grams of white rice to 50 grams of brown rice you get the same amount of energy but now you have some fiber you have some vitamins and you have some minerals. Now you swap the same brown rice for 50 grams of quinoa. You now have added more vitamins and some protein in there as well. Yeah. Now it's not to say you can never have white rice, but you're getting a better bang for your buck. If you're getting the brown rice or quinoa or a mix, we do a mix in our house just to, you know, make sure that smallies will eat them. Yeah. Um, but just to, to make sure that you're getting it in, but you're getting more nutrients from that food and because this fiber in there it's going to slow down the rate of absorption in your body and you don't get the same insulin spike yeah I, well, i'm not getting it. go for it sorry sorry one one thing that i do with them um, uh when i'm doing brown rice and, and i i love it is i put in some tamari sauce when i'm cooking it and uh, it just gives it a lovely you know if people find that they find mm -hmm. rice a bit boring after white rice Try it with tamari um, sauce to sprinkle a few drops and it really yeah. changes it. It gives it a nice um, little taste. It's just a tip in terms yeah. of... Yeah, the other thing I, I'm doing now to hide... <laughs> it's all about hiding food in my house. Um, <laughs> to hide the food is I put in a teaspoon of turmeric powder. So we have yellow rice. So the kids okay. think it's very exotic altogether. <laughs> That's a tip. That's brilliant. But they don't notice that they actually don't, then they don't know what they're eating. But, and you can also put in like a few like frozen peas or something like that in as well, or use your rice in a kind of a stir fried rice setup. And look at it, if you don't like the taste of it, start small, you know, put half white rice and half brown rice, hide it on yourself because yeah. sometimes it, the, the thought of it is, is worse than actually, you know, the flavor, but you know, just gradually. And look, if you don't like brown rice, There'll be another way of getting it in, but it's those small changes can actually make all of the difference on not driving up your insulin to the same level and getting more nutrients in every time you're eating. Yeah. That's one thing. Switching over to the browns versus the whites. 
The second thing when it comes to eating, to avoid this blood sugar roller coaster that can happen when you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, you get a spike of, of sugar and then it drops really fast because what goes up must come down. So if you add some protein to it or fat, it will make it, it will make that roller coaster less severe. So it's like if you think of, if you scrunch up a piece of paper and you throw it onto a fire and you get a flash of flame, you get a big energy source, but then it disappears quite quickly. If you change the piece of paper to a piece of timber, you don't get the same flash of flame, but it lasts for a lot longer. That's what you're trying to do with your meal by adding in your proteins and your fats and your fiber. You're slowing down that, that release of energy so it lasts you much longer and you don't have the same insulin demand each time. So proteins will be any type of meat, veg, or meat, veg, meat uh, fish, eggs, there's quinoa, there's beans and pulses, any of the vegetarian sources, cheese, you know, there's lots of different sources and lots of variety is always good and our good old fats drop of extra, you know, have a lovely egg salad or a salmon salad or a tuna salad with extra virgin olive oil dressing on top and you, you know, you've got a very substantial meal with good fats and protein to sustain you until your next meal. Um, then the, the, the body comes out and we, the refined treats, then I suppose we need to just watch the quantity of those. Um, I would have, and I'd find it particularly a very dangerous period in, in people's lives is after having a baby, but now clearly COVID puts a, a stop to it. But if <laughs> you, all the, you know, all the bacon we did, Linda, oh mother of God, I don't no, think ever bacon. I know. <laughs> well, and, and that's a perfect example, Catherine. You're at home and you're bored and you make yeah. a cake and then you go to the press and you have a, you know, you have your breakfast or you mightn't really be hungry for breakfast and you have a slice of the beautiful banana bread because you've used up the, the black bananas and a cup of tea at 11 o'clock. And then you get to lunchtime and you're not really hungry. So you don't bother having a proper lunch. And then you get to two o'clock or half two and it's nearly gone too late for lunch. So you have another slice of banana bread and a cup of tea. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's dinner time and you haven't had a nutrient in you all day long. Now, the banana bread is not the problem. But if you're missing meals because of the banana bread or the scone or whatever, you're not getting the nutrients. It's the nourishment is what we're looking for. The treat is not the problem, but we have to get the foundations in right to make sure you're nourished and you're nourishing your brain, you know. Yeah. That's where we're at. Um, when, so when, blood sugar. Sorry, Linda, just when you were talking there um, uh, about sugar and, um, you know, uh, I guess like um, I would have every night um, after dinner, I'd have my um, cup of mint tea and I'd have a square. I, I'm, I am actually very good. I limit myself. Mm. I'd have a square of 85% dark chocolate. Yeah. I kind of, that's my thing. But for people, you know, for some people who, you know, there may be a lot more sugar throughout the day, you know, yeah. any good advice in terms of trying to reduce it, trying to, you know, just slowly start cutting it down. Yeah, I think slowly is, is the first thing. Um, some people will go hell for leather and they'll give up everything and then they get a sniff of the dairy milk and they nearly lose all sense of reason. So I would be absolutely slowly. And like yeah. chocolate is not a problem or having a treat is not a problem at all. But when I was saying about making the meals more nutritious, that will definitely help. So if you're having, instead of having a cup of tea with a slice of toast, if you're having a cup of tea with you know, uh, an omelette, say for your breakfast, you're going to be more satisfied and more nourished after that. Nothing wrong with the slice of bread occasionally, but it's just to get the nourishment in. And definitely, if you're having snacks, try and make them a healthier snack rather than a treat, even if that means making, you know, I know it sounds boring if you're talking about having a piece of fruit and some nuts or something like that, but sometimes it can be really tasty or make mm -hmm. it, you know, chop the apple up. I mean, another one with kids, but instead of handing them an apple, which they'll eat a couple of bites out of and leave it there, if I chop it into pieces and give it to them chopped up, they'll eat it all and enjoy it, you know, and it's, or sometimes I'll give them nut butter on the side so they can dip it into it. Something simple like that. Or, and add, get the good treats into the house. I suppose if you're trying to wean yourself off the, the treats and stuff in the house, I try and get keep them out because if they're in the house, it's very hard to avoid them. So get yourself better quality chocolate and have a square of that after your meal or 
three squares of that after a meal, whatever to get you to transition. But definitely by having more substantial nourishing meals, like I would rather somebody add more fat to their dinner or their lunch and then have a small snack afterwards and having a small lunch so they can have a packet of crisps and a bar of yeah. chocolate afterwards, you know? Yeah. So having the, the nutrients in your meal and then have your snack so that you're not feeling deprived, yeah. I think is important. And I, I, you just mentioned the thing here that, oh God, I, I just think we've completely has, has slid into our, not, you know, across the board. If you're out for lunch, this whole thing of the sandwich with the crisps on the plate, you know, that's something that snuck in that kind of, God, we never did that years ago. Um, so again, I guess it's even when you're out as well, it's just trying to make the food choices that are more beneficial to you, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, some people will go out once a week for their lunch and they'll have a sandwich with crisps and that's fine. But if you're having it every day consistently, it just adds up to, you know, if you're having the crisps on the side, you're missing something more nutritious. That's, that's what I'm always looking at. When I look at a food diary, I'm not looking to see what's there. I'm looking to see what's missing. Yeah. And often you'll see, I suppose my next thing is, is fruit and veg and color and antioxidants and nutrients that you get the polyphenols and all those, you know, loads of words and terms for all these things. But to get the nourishment from your food, they're the thing that's often missing. So if, for example, you get... A toasted sandwich um, with a side, you know, toast sandwich and chips for or crisps for your lunch. There's very little color. There may be a slice or two of tomato, but what you can fit between two slices of bread is fairly limited when you're trying to bulk it with veg or color. Whereas if you had an open brown bread sandwich or even sourdough toast or whatever kind of one slice of it with a plate of salad, you're getting a lot more color and you know, crunch and different variety of nutrients on your plate. So you're going to get a lot more benefit from it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's small switches. It doesn't mean that you can never have the nice things again, but it's to try and get as much, especially if you're worried, if you have a symptom, you might need to be a little bit stricter on yourself. Like if you do feel, you know, that your memory is not as good as it was, or you're feeling bad PMS or your menopause is driving you cracked, you might need to be a little bit tighter on your on your diet for a short period of time while looking at your stress and your sleep and your movement. Obviously, you know, it, it's, it's it's across the whole. Yeah. Some people are so disciplined on their diet that they're actually stressing themselves out more. And you don't want that either. Do you know, yeah. food should bring a bit of enjoyment when this lockdown eventually ends and we can meet people for lunch or coffee again. It should be about, you know, more than just inhaling something as you're running out the door or jumping into the car or whatever thing you know I, I I always say you know it's the 80 20 rule you know I think if we can be paid sense of the time you know it gives us that little bit of flexibility because you know we have to have a life and we have to enjoy it oh, of course so um yeah yeah it, and it's important I mean stress people will get themselves and even when it comes to, say, people trying to lose weight or whatever, like if people are counting calories or counting macros, it just becomes a very obsessive thing about mm. what am I having and how many carbs or how much, you know, it, it just it it just makes it all very stressful. And you yeah. really don't want to be putting yourself under that kind of pressure or developing that kind of relationship with food. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be doing that to you, you know, if food should be a lot less, it shouldn't be having a stressful effect on your life. Yeah. Um, and particularly, you know, particularly uh, to kind of when you look at midlife, um, I mean, you know, the food is so, so, I mean, it's just, I can't emphasize enough how important it is. And it's, it's kind of like, it's like that though, at the same time, it's not making it a stress or I, I guess I'm very much a fan of them. Um, I'm not a fan of fad diets at all. Um, I'm very much for uh, your eating habits. Your food is a way of life and it's not a temporary thing. It's, it's just a way of life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree with you completely. Um, let, let's talk uh, about um, go for it. Um, just gut health. We talk about, a little bit about yeah. brain and the gut health. Yeah, uh, gut health is 
like I'm not going to say everything starts in the gut, but a lot of things start in the gut. So, um, I mean, I, I work, I suppose, a lot with uh, female health. So everything from PMS to fertility to menopause, PCOS, all that kind of stuff. And people will come in to me saying, you know, my symptoms are the hormonal symptoms they'd be talking about would be very bad. And I said, right, you know, let's talk about bowel movements. And they're looking at me going, oh, woman, what are you doing to me? Please don't do this. <laughs> but I suppose if your gut is not healthy, that's where we need to start. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you can think your gut is healthy um, and, you know, very quickly we'll identify some symptoms that are associated with, with an imbalance in your gut. So there is having a bowel movement every day, if at all possible, is important. One of the more important reasons is because we need to ensure that we're eliminating any toxins toxins that your body's producing or, you know, ingesting or whatever. But also we want to eliminate any waste hormones. So if somebody's got an imbalance of their hormones, and I know with brain health, you're talking about dropping estrogen levels. But before we even get there, I suppose, you know, brain health can start back in your 30s. It's not Mm -hmm. just, you know, when you turn 55 that you need to start thinking about it. So if you have PMS in your 20s and you're having problems with that, getting that under control then is actually going to contribute to an improvement in your brain health down the road. Um, Elimination is really important. So making sure that you're having a bowel movement is important. So ensuring that you have enough fiber in your diet is important. If you need to take a supplement to ensure there's enough fiber in your diet, that's something that you can add in quite easily. Um, and Silifloor is a product that we use a lot in clinic for people because it's it's an easy way to add it in while you're trying to get the diet to where you need it to be. Yeah, yeah and it's just, I suppose, it's to be realistic about in the short term, if you're trying to get some symptom relief, like if somebody's very constipated and we need to resolve the, the difficulties they're having, by adding in some supplements, it may actually give them some short-term relief until we get them their diet to where we need to be. The other thing, and I suppose from a microbiome, there's the, the microbiome is the, the bugs that live in your large intestine. And there are trillions of them. There are more of them than we have cells in our body, which is a delightful idea. But, you know, I mean, and, and the more we know, the more we're figuring out that we don't know. There are bugs down there that have names that we know if they're missing in some guts that people will be overweight we know that there are bugs specifically that will have a huge impact on your mood. You know, we, like, and we don't know half of what's going on. Like, we, we know it's hugely important. Mm-hmm. One of the simplest things, sorry, mm-hmm. now, Chris, my phone is going to ring. But one of the simplest things that you can do, to, once you're having a bowel movement, one of the simplest things you can do to improve the diversity and the mix in your, of the microbiome is to feed them. Yeah. And the best thing to feed them is fiber Mm -hmm. so plant-based foods are really important and there is the latest number that's been uh, people are talking about is aim for 30 now you know people are going what (laughs) so if you try and have 30 different plants every week Mm -hmm. so people are doing sorry now i thought you were going to say i'll keep bringing um rabbits (laughs) pardon I thought you were going to say every day, 30 every day. Oh, no, 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 no. I wouldn't do that to you now. <laughs> no. uh, when, when you look at getting in the, um, the, the, the good bacteria, which is then split into the prebiotics, which are the kind of, I always refer to the prebiotics as the fertilizers for the probiotics. Yeah. The probiotics, I guess, are the thing people know more about. But like your, yeah. your prebiotics, so your garlic, your... Uh, leeks your artichokes and all of these and then you yeah know, you've got your fruit and vegetables and your fermented foods that can be your probiotic but when when you start looking at it that way you can you can reach i think you can reach 30 probably very easily over a week um you know when you have yeah, to, it's, things like that yeah because it's not just vegetables it's all plant foods so it's whole yeah. grains so something like a brown yeah. rice will join in sorry the sound has gone a bit funny there when that phone rang so i don't know if i'm shouting You're at fine. you or not i apologize <laughs> um things like whole grains your fruit vegetables nuts and seeds any of your fresh herbs they don't count as a full portion but you can count them in there yeah. and your legumes so your beans lentils and pulses 
So for example, if you have a portion of, um, if you add lentils to a bolognese, part of your, your mince, you know, your meat bolognese, if you add lentils in there, that's a portion or that's one plant food increase in, included. Mm. If you're having a tub of hummus, which is made from chickpeas, that's another type of plant food included. Yes. So sometimes it's just a matter of looking to see, can you tweak your choices? Yeah. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not a vegetarian by any stretch of the imagination, but I definitely do think that we can include more variety and include some plant proteins into our diet that will help. And from a hormone perspective, um, which we're trying to eliminate the excess hormones, having things like beans, lentils and pulses are really good for helping with that mm. hormone elimination. So it can be really important as well. Yeah. Um, but you can eat plenty. Like if somebody's had a course of antibiotics, definitely I would recommend a course of probiotics. But you're right. The prebiotics are the food for the bugs and they'll do the job yeah. without you having to buy expensive probiotics if you don't need them. Yeah. And particularly like I do, um, I always have milk kefir. We, we have it every single day. The dog has it. The kids have it. We all have it. And, you know, we have our own little mushroom. We feed it at home. We get the output or whatever. And I have to say, um, I've gone through periods, not this year, but maybe last year, where I've gone for maybe two or three weeks where I haven't taken the milk kefir. Maybe if we froze it and it died or something happened. And you can tell the difference. You, I can mm. tell the difference. It has um, a huge, I would find personally, the milk kefir really works for me. And milk kefir yeah. contains more strains of probiotics than any of the fermented foods. And um, so yeah. if anyone is interested in, in, in using milk kefir, there's a very good Facebook group called Starter Cultures Ireland. And you can go on to that group and just say where you live and someone will kind of say, well, I live near you. And you, you never pay for um, fermented foods. They're just passed from person to person. Yeah. Um, but they're certainly, I, I, I think fermented foods are, are kind of pretty much an essential add yeah. to the diet. Yeah. Because the other thing I suppose to realize the good old stress when we come back to it, yeah. um, if your stress levels are elevated, it's going to put pressure on your microbiome gets reduced and the diversity gets reduced. So any diversity that you're getting in there is good. And for anyone who can't tolerate dairy, you can take, a, there's a water kefir um, as yeah. well. So you can take that or there's other there's kombuchas and stuff as well that you can take, which if you're, if you're dairy intolerant, but because the process, unless you're, you know, completely dairy intolerant, a lot of people can tolerate dairy kefir, even if they're not big dairy consumers. So it's worth trying if, if, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so that's kind of, um, we've talked about uh, the omegas, the fats, we've talked about um, the fruit and vegetables, we've talked about the gut health, we've talked about stress, um, and we've talked about reducing refined sugar and processed foods. Blood sugar balance, yeah. Blood sugar balance. Um, I think, is that, am I missing? The one thing I just wanted to mention, um, is time restricted feeding so and it's only because it's it's very in the media at the moment yeah. and i suppose i've done a lot of research i didn't start on it from a brain health perspective um i started on it from an aging perspective actually would you believe okay but there is there's a lot of research coming out of california a guy called Sachin panda on time restricted feeding and he connects it all back to the circadian rhythm so hmm. the theory is that Back in the day when we were all kids and the kitchen closed in the evening, you would have your dinner and you stop eating in the evening. Now the kitchen doesn't close anymore. Um, so we're all eating longer periods of time. But there is a huge amount of research now supporting if you're eating in a shorter window, it is better for your health. Now, from a brain health perspective, how that helps is because your brain actually, a lot of the debris that we naturally produce in our brain gets decluttered at night mm. and it gets cleared out. Um, but your body can't start working on that if it's still trying to digest your food if you've had a late meal or whatever. Mm. So one of the simplest recommendations, if people can tolerate it at all, is to have your dinner at six or seven o'clock in the evening, half seven if it, if it takes to it, and allow yourself at least 12 or up to 14 hours of a fast overnight. Yeah. Now, 
that means you can drink water, you can drink um, herbal teas with no, um, like you can't have coffee with the milk in it in the morning. Um, but the, there's a, a term called autophagy, which, you know, it's, it's really beneficial for your body. And I suppose back through the ages, if you read up on it a bit, back through the ages, like in Ireland, we would have had a, a kind of a fasting day every Friday, even though we didn't know that that's what we were doing. You know, we would have fasted for Lent. There's, there's religions all over the world that are doing it, not realizing the health benefits, but actually it can be very beneficial in short periods of time. Yeah. So to give yourself a break overnight, finish at seven, have your breakfast at nine o'clock the next day, um, it can be really, really beneficial. And it, it can be quite a simple thing to do. There is a habit that people have a cup of tea and something at night and, yeah. you know, bring your, your nighttime square chocolate into your dinner. Yeah. And then finish up for the night um, if you can no, manage it all. And maybe do it five nights a week. So if you go out for a dinner or you go out for a drink or whatever on a Saturday night, that's absolutely fine. But the other nights will give yourself a little bit of a break. But from a brain health perspective, it's really good for helping to for your, your brain to detoxify. Yeah. And by all accounts, you sleep better as well. That's good yeah. anti-aging. <laughs> just, I was just going to say that I, I, I did um, um, an interview yesterday with... Um, uh, Breach Levy, the sleep consultants. I have to post it up here yet, and that is something that um, that we talked about. The other thing, just I was thinking of when we were chatting there, Linda, is that um, one thing when it does come to the brain, and it'd be remiss of me if I didn't mention this. And I know everyone's kind of like, oh, don't mention that, but I I, I have to mention alcohol um, because obviously, um, you know, high intake of alcohol and the wine o'clock that certainly I think you know has kind of crept in with COVID um you know it really I can't impress how negative it is on so many levels our immune system is impacted our brain health is impacted um it's it's just a, a small glass of red wine maybe once twice a week is certainly good for the brain but on a regular daily basis and in um, not when it's not in moderation, it certainly it is no friend to your brain at all, I'm afraid. So it's one thing um, to, to really just take into account. And the other thing is, is that when you do have alcohol at nighttime, you might think, oh, yes, I fall asleep quick and everything. Yes, you might fall asleep quickly, but your sleep is never of the same quality as yeah. sleep without alcohol um yeah you know so it's completely agree yeah yeah it's and it's from a blood sugar perspective i mean if you think about it if we were only looking at calories you know you're not going to have two or three bars of chocolate every night or if you are you're kind of going to go i oh, shouldn't be doing this every night yeah whereas you'll have potentially two or three glasses of wine and it has it's it's over covid it has become more of a habit with with more people mm -hmm. And you're right, the occasional drink or having a drink at the weekend is not a big deal. Yeah. But if you if your blood sugar, if you're drinking a glass of alcohol, it's drinking a glass of glucose. So when that besides the alcohol, it's drinking a glass of glucose. So your insulin's going up when you should be going to sleep. Then it's crashing in the middle of the night. Your stress hormone is increasing to try and deal with this fight or flight situation and things you're in. And that's before you ever look at the impact that the alcohol is having on your body. Do you know? So yeah. it is. Yeah. As I say, when people are having symptoms, you might need to look at it a little bit more closely and maybe you can slacken off a little bit, you know, and yeah. have a glass or two. But it's definitely worth giving yourself at least a couple of nights alcohol free during the week, at least a couple of nights. Yeah. OK, yeah. Annie, um, that was fantastic, Linda. Um, I think we covered the, the key areas. Obviously, we could talk for days, weeks <laughs> about, uh, about. We could. There's a lot to go through. There is. Yeah. Any any final thing you want to mention? Any final no, thing? I suppose it's just back to what I said at the beginning. I mean, really focus on the nutrients that your body needs. Focus on getting in the good fats and um, focus on getting, you know, nourish your body, eat real food and try as much as possible to even if you're having snacks to have nourishing snacks rather than a treat snack. It, it's not that you're taking away the treat. It's just to put in the nutrients so that you're supporting your body most of the time so that you're feeling well, that your heart is healthy, your mind is healthy, your hormones are healthy, that you're feeling good. 
that's what it's all about. Um, so to focus on that rather than what you're trying to, to take out, focus on putting in the good stuff first. Yeah. Get Very the foundations good. right. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. Okay, well, thanks everyone for watching. And um, this will be saved on ITGV and uh, it'll be uploaded uh, to the website and other places um, later. So thanks a million, Linda. And uh, Thanks for having me, Catherine. Chat to you soon. Okay. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.